title of today's sermon is called Becoming a Person of Influence. Becoming a Person of Influence. We're going to read from Daniel chapter 1, verse 8 through 16. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8 through 16. It's a little bit long, but I think it'll be okay. Um, while you read this scripture out loud, I'm going to drink some water if you don't mind. So, Daniel chapter 1, verse 8 through 16. Let's begin. But Daniel was determined... Now <coughs> God has given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. <clears throat> Daniel spoke with the altogether attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test us for ten days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of the ten days, see how we look compared to the other younger men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decisions in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. When I was in college, my major was business administration. I was a business major. Uh, my goal in life uh, when I was young was to be a millionaire. And who would have thought that I am now a millionaire? In one, not dollar, but one, I am a millionaire. Um, Really, honestly, my goal was to be a millionaire. As a business major, one of the subjects that uh, we were taught or we, we learn uh, is a subject of leadership. Leadership. And, there, and in the book, one of the questions that they ask you is, how do you define leadership? And there are many definitions to leadership. Uh, oftentimes, people define leadership in a sense of someone taking charge, someone being able to lead people, someone that's able to inspire people. That's part of leadership. But oftentimes, that's the image and the definition that we have of leadership. Telling people what to do, leading people, having a strong personality. But really, when you examine the true definition of leadership, those, what I just spoke to you about is not really leadership, but it's more of personality. Because people lead in different manner. The best definition that I read on leadership was the ability to influence others. In my opinion, that was probably the best definition and the most correct definition. True leader has the ability to influence people to do things. Ability to take charge, that's more of your personality. That's not my personality. I'm not one of those people that's going to stand in the front and say, let's go everyone, let's go. That's not me. There are different ways to lead. But true leadership is... Whichever personality and however you do it is, is having the ability to influence other people. And for years and years and years throughout history, people have tried to perfect that ability to influence people. Many people, they take you know, uh, you know, speech courses. What, I, I forgot the term, but uh, they tell you to be aggressive when you talk to people. You know, some people say, you know, you know, you know, use your body language. You know, some people try to give you leadership on how to control people and manipulate people. Well, you know what? That doesn't work. When we study the Bible, actually, in the, in the life of Daniel, we can see clearly his ability to influence people. In fact, this passage tells us about Daniel. He was, an, he was a Jew. He was an Israelite. As a young man, his nation was conquered by the Babylonians. In today's, you know, today's culture, today's time, you know, it's located in the area of Iraq. The Babylonians were a great empire. And around 600, I believe it was around 600 B.C., they conquered Jerusalem. And when they conquered Jerusalem, they not only plundered the city with all of, with, of, uh, of all its treasure and wealth, what they did was they also took the best skilled people of Jerusalem and took them and brought them to Babylon, 
to their country. They brought all these people, you know, you know, with skills with craftsmen and carpenters and, and thinkers and all these people, and they brought them to their country. And when they did, this is what the Babylonian uh, King Nebuchadnezzar did. He tried to, in a way, brainwash them. He wanted to train them, but more importantly, he wanted to train them and change them and brainwash them. He wanted to influence them. He wanted them to uh, forget Jerusalem, and he wanted them to be loyal to Babylonian Empire. And he did so by using many different methods. He tried to do it by changing their you know, language, making them speak, you know, forget their original language. He tried to do it by changing the way they you know, dress, the way they act, the way they speak, but also he tried to do that by also by giving them different names. Daniel, they, they tried to change his name to, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Daniel had four friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And they tried to change their name to Belshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So King Nebuchadnezzar, he tried to influence them, tried to change them by forcibly changing their lifestyle the way they eat, the way they dress, the way they talk, and even by changing their name. But, in, but instead of King Nebuchadnezzar changing them, Daniel was able to turn that around and influence King Nebuchadnezzar or the entire Babylonian culture. How was he able to do that? The Bible tells us that he was a young man when he came over. He was young. And at a young age, going to a foreign land, a huge empire, probably buildings were much bigger than what he saw in Jerusalem, being in awe of what's going on. And yet he was able to influence other people. How was he able to do that? Number one, verse 8 tells us the Babylonian ways didn't work. The Babylonians try to tell them, okay, one of the things they try to tell them, forgive me, I'm a little lost here, but forgive me. One of the ways they try to change Daniel was to also have him change his diet. They were trying to make Daniel eat certain things and eat certain food that by his own tradition, he didn't eat. But they wanted him to change everything about his lifestyle, even the way he ate. In verse 8, Daniel said, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself. See, Daniel was able to influence other people because Daniel with him, within him had certain qualities, certain character. And those character enabled him to influence people. And by studying the life of Daniel, we can understand and we can learn how we can be a person of influence. How we can live our lives influencing other people. In verse 8, he says, he resolved not to defile himself. So the food that they offered to Daniel was food that was really offered to the Babylonian gods called Bel. And Daniel, he said, you know what? That's not what I believe. And I refuse to partake in those food. And he, had, he was resolved. He had conviction. He had principle. He, had, he was passionate about his belief. So Daniel stood by his conviction and his commi commitment and said he would not eat them. Despite all the circumstances, Daniel remained a man of principle. This is a truth that we need to keep in mind. Oftentimes we think that people follow power, money, and status, that's just not true. Every book that I've read, and I've read, believe me, because I wanted to be a good pastor and good leader, I've read many, many books on leadership. And one thing that every one of those books shared that's, that had in common is this. People do not follow power, money, or status. Do you? You may follow them in front of them, but that's not really following them. A person that truly follows someone means they follow them, they follow them whether they're there or not, and they support them, they encourage them. People do not follow power, money, or status, but instead we have to understand people, they follow passion and principle and commitment. 
people follow passion, principle, and commitment. Think about all the people that, that you have admired. People, you know, think about all the people that you support and do you admire. It's not because they're wealthy. If you admire someone because they're a millionaire, then you need to grow up. If you admire someone because, simply because they have a big building, then really, you haven't grown up yet. But the people that every one of us, we truly admire and respect and follow, that have influenced us are people that have had passion, people that were, had principle, and people that were devoted and were committed. Some of the greatest leaders in history were not known for their wealth or power, but they have always been known for their passion, commitment, and principle. People like Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi. He was not a wealthy man, but he was a man of principle, a passion, and commitment. Martin Luther King Jr., he was not a man of great wealth, but he was a man of principle, passion, and he was committed. And the great men in history, they all have that in common. They were great men of passion, principle, and commitment. But let me just tell you this. If we want to be truly a person that influences others, you need more than that. You need more than passion, principle, and commitment. One must also have, this is the second point, have gentleness, humility, and love. If passion and commitment were enough to influence people, then half the world, half the people in this world would be ruled by lunatics, crazy people. You know what's one thing crazy people have in common with great men and women of, you know, of history? They were both passionate and committed, and they had their own principle. Of course, crazy people, you know, their beliefs and principles were a little you know, flawed, you see, having passion and principle and commitment is really not enough if we truly want to influence the world or, pe or, or be a people of influence. You must also have wisdom to convey that truth in a manner that people will accept, respond, and obey. And when you notice, when you look at the scripture, you notice that, that Daniel... Daniel held great favor, was, was held in great regard by the chief official over him. In verse 9, it says, Now God has given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. This is like saying the president of Hyundai Company is having a respect for one of the employees, or you know, one of the car attendants perhaps. This was a chief of attendant, uh, chief of Staff, he's a man of great position and high status, and yet he said he held great respect for Daniel. Daniel was one of the slaves. It's like President Hyundai going to the parking lot attendant and saying, you know what, I respect you so much. I want to know what you have to say. What, how do you feel about these things? How was it that Daniel was able to earn such respect from someone that was in much higher status. Verse 19 and 20 also tells us that he was also well liked by King Nebuchadnezzar. It's like President Lee coming to me and say, you know, Pastor Paul, tell me how to run Korea. Well, it's not going to happen, but it's like that. How was it that Daniel was able to have such influence over such great people or, you know, uh, people of high stature. There was something about Daniel that was likable. There was something about Daniel that people were drawn to. It wasn't just that he was a man of principle, man of passion, and man of commitment, but there was something else. What was that? Let's take a look at the Daniel's approach toward the chief, chief officer in verse 8. So even though Daniel was passionate about his belief, he did not speak arrogantly 
about what God had to say, what God told him to do. He, did, he stayed pure. He, he did not convey, he did not come across as someone that was arrogant or that I was better than you. In verse 8, it says, But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. See, he felt God's conviction not to eat those food. So he asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable food. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. See, Daniel was a great man of God. He was very passionate about obeying God. He had his beliefs and principle. God told me not to do this, therefore I will not do it. And for some of us, we can be very arrogant about this. For some of us, we can come across and say, Hey, I am a Christian, therefore I will not do it. I am a man of God. How dare you force me to do it? And throughout history, there have been many people that have been like that. We take our faith and we wear it with arrogance. We feel that we are better than other people. Does that influence other people? It doesn't. Daniel knew that. Even though he knew that God was with him. Even though he knew that what the, the, the decision that he made was right. He, he humbly approached the chief official and said, he humbly said, I want to get your permission. You see, you can have passion, principle, and commitment. But you cannot influence people if you approach people, if you communicate that with arrogance and pride. But when you convey that, and when you communicate that with humility, man, people listen. You know, to be honest with you, this is something that I've had trouble with for a long, long time. You know, by nature, when I, you know, when I was young, I was very insecure. And I've always wanted to come, up, come across as being strong. I didn't realize that trying to come across as being strong was really a sign of weakness. Proverbs 15.1 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath. Proverbs 16.21 says, The wise in heart are called discerning, and the pleasant words promote instruction. Proverbs 16.24 says, Pleasant words are honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. What are they saying? They're saying, this passage speaks of the influencing power of gentle words. You know, too often we think that we must exert power and authority for people to listen. That's just not true. A gentle word, a kind word, a humble word actually, actually uh, causes people to do greater things. Actually leads us to have greater influence on people. You know, I have this attitude too. You know, I don't care how right a person might be. I just want to be asked nicely. They may be my boss. They may be my superior. They may be my teacher. And they have every right to exert their authority over me. But in the end, still, I want to be asked nicely. Isn't it true for all of us? You know, when I was in Houston, I was fortunate enough to serve under one of the most well-known Korean pastors in America and in Korea. Uh, he is a well-known author. He is a pastor of the largest Korean church in Texas, and is nearly 25 years my senior. Even though he was my senior pastor, one of the things that I really always appreciated about that I appreciated about him was that. He never came, he never approached me with authority. He never said, because I'm your boss, you must do this, you must do that. Even though he had every right to do so. And if he did, guess what? 
I would have done it because he was my boss. But there's one thing that I always appreciated about him was that even though he had every right to do so, he always started his statement with, could you do me a favor? Every time he wanted something done, every time he wanted something from me, every, every time he wanted me to do certain things, instead of saying, you know, Paul, uh, this, is, this is not being done right, I want you to do this. He never approached me that way. He would always say, Pastor Lee, could you do me a favor? And as someone, you know, on the receiving end of that type of humility, my reaction is, man, even if I don't want to do it, I want to do it. Why? Because he asked so nicely. Because he has shown me so much respect. And he has given me so much authority. I want to do it. Throughout history, great men who was able to influence others, they had these in common. They were men of principle. They were men of passion and they were men of commitment. But more than that, they had the strength and the humility to communicate those words in a very gentle and kind way. Again, think about the people that, that have influenced you. And I'm probably right when I say that, that those people had these character. Daniel had affection and respect from his superiors. It means that Daniel carried great amount of weight because he was highly regarded by his superiors and his king. In other words, Daniel had significant influence over these people. Why? Because he was a man of principle, passion, commitment, and he was able to deliver that with strength and humility. But let me add one last thing. Having passion and principle is good. Having gentleness and humility is great. But ultimately, a person must have one more thing to be truly a person of influence. And that character is faith. Faith in God. I may be passionate about a cause, I may be very sensitive in how I, how I proceed towards that cause. But if I'm not willing to act in faith, very little will happen. So you may have passion for something, and that may lead you to do certain things. And you may have the wisdom and the strength to be humble, and you may be well-liked. But ultimately, it, it is faith it is faith in God. It is our trust and belief and faith in God that will enable us to endure and persevere and continue. The early church turned the world upside down. They did it because they had passion, the humility, but the most of all, faith. Faith to go to the ends of the world sharing the good news of God. If you're passionate, if you're passionate about me, you'll come to this church. If you're humble and gentle, you will respect me. But that alone is not going to make you go out on the streets and witness to people. That alone is not going to make you go and sacrifice your career, your job, your time. But it is the faith. It's the faith in God and all that God stands for that will enable you. That is the thing that's going to make us go to the ends of the earth. The early church turned the world upside down, not because they were just passionate, not because they were just humble and gentle, but they were able to go to the ends of the earth because of their faith in God. It took faith for Esther to go before King Xerxes and ask him to reverse Haman's evil plan. 
Read the story. Very interesting story. It took faith for Nehemiah to ask permission to his king to leave his king's country, go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. To travel thousands of miles without any guarantee. But he took faith because he had faith in God. He was able to do so. In Daniel chapter 2 verse 16, he took faith for Daniel to find courage to stand up to the king's orders. Again, passion and principle might move people. But it is ultimately the faith in God that allows us to endure, persevere, and continue. That's why the Bible tells us that with faith, we can even move mountains. And it's that faith that influences and impacts others. Look at Daniel chapter 6, verse 25 to 27. And the end result of his faith. Then King Darius, the new king of Babylon, sent this message to the people of every race, nation, and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before God of Daniel, the God that Daniel believed. For he is the living God, and he will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed. His rule will never end. He, he rescues and saves his people. He performs miraculous signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. These are the words from a king who does not believe in God. But Daniel was able to influence even a king because of his passion, his principle, and his commitment. Because of his humility and gentleness. But most of all, because of his faith in God, he was able to influence even the kings. Today we live in a society where there are many broken homes and many broken families. And God has called all of us as the followers of Christ to impact and influence this hurting world. But we cannot do it without passion and principle. We have to be passionate about people. We have to have the principle in saying, you know what? I know that obeying God is greater than above, is above everything else. We cannot impact this world without that passion and principle. But more importantly, we cannot deliver this passion and principle without humility. People will not accept what we have to say or, or what God has to say unless we approach it with humility. But most of all, we cannot impact and influence this world unless we have true faith in God. I am a father of two children. And my prayer for them every day is that they will be someone greater than their own mother and father. A few weeks ago, no, last week, one of my students at Chungnam University asked me, what do you want your children to be when they grow up? And I told them, I want my son to be a pastor because I am a pastor. But I told them, I want my son to be a far better pastor than me. I want my son to be a great, great man. And I know that in order for my son and daughter to be truly great, they have to be people of principle and passion. Even just a couple of days ago, I had a talk with my daughter. I told Faith, Faith, you may make mistakes, but there's one thing that Daddy hates the most and that Daddy will never tolerate is for you to lie. I said, Faith, don't ever, ever lie. Because in order for my children to become a truly great men and women, 
that influences, that impacts this world. They have to be people of passion, principle, and commitment. And I want to raise them also truly believing, believing in the Almighty God. And I know that if they have those things, they will be, they can be, and they will be people of great influence. I hope all of you guys feel the same way about yourselves and about your children. Let us pray.